Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you for this beautiful day that you've blessed us with. And I thank you, Lord God, for all the many things that you have blessed us with in this place. God, I, I ask a special blessing on all those involved with, with fixing up the outside, making this place look beautiful. And Lord, we do that not for ourselves, Lord God, we do it for you, to bring you glory. To let people know in this world that in this place, there's people that revere our God and want to serve him in whatever way we can. And we want to make it good. But Lord, more importantly than the outside of what this building looks like, or even on the inside of what this building looks like, God, we desire to re reflect you in our lives. Lord, we want to draw closer to you. We want people to see Jesus whenever they talk to us, whenever they look at us, whatever they see us doing anything, Lord. I pray that, Lord, it comes to their mind that this is Jesus. Not because we are, because you are living in us and we want your life to reflect out into this world. Lord, that's our desire. And only can, it can only happen when we call upon you and, and walk with you, Lord. So I pray, Lord God, for this word today, that, that you would open up my mouth to speak forth your heart to the lives of the people here and those that will hear it, Lord God, that what I have to say, Lord God, comes from your, your heart to make a difference in our lives. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, outside of Jesus, I have nothing to say to you. I could give you a line, but the truth is, I really have nothing to say to you. But it's what God gives us, and it's His Word, and I, I love this Word. So I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to read uh, chapter 24 again. Uh, just bear with me; you'll see where I'm going by the end of the afternoon. <laughs> now, after five days, this is chapter 24 in Acts. Now after five days, Ananias the high priest came down with the elders in a certain order named Tertullus. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And when he was called upon, Tertullus began his accusation, saying, seeing that, you, through, seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is brought, being brought to this nation by your foresight, we accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you by any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. For we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him, and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander, Lysias, came by and with great violence took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so. Then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because you may ascertain that it is no more than twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship." And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God that they were there themselves also, excuse me, I have hope in God which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Now after many years I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me. Or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council, unless it is for this one statement which I cried out standing among them. Concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. We'll stop right there for just a moment. Now I know we talked about this last week, didn't we? But there's something I want to, uh, that I believe I left out, 
and and uh, so I want to I want to look at uh, Luke chapter uh, twenty one, verse twelve and thirteen. It says this. And this is these are the words of Jesus. But by all these things they will lay your, their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. That sounds exciting. This is what happened to Paul. This is what he's going through right now. Jesus said this is what's going to happen. It could happen to you. It could. Each and every one of you, that could happen at some point in time. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. And therein lies the joy. Therein, it's awesome. What we see here is Paul sitting, and I am so amazed that how he can sit quietly as these people accuse him falsely of these things. And it's happened prior to this. But let's think back. In the last, now I, I believe, don't hold me to the, any of these numbers, they're ballparkish, based on my kind of some, some uh, looking it up and stuff. But I believe Paul's been uh, actively working for Jesus about 16 years at this point in time. He's been, uh, like I believe, about six years or eight years in, in his three different mission trips, of which he traveled well over t uh, 10,000 miles just by foot. Then there's also in the boat. So, so he's been around, and he's been going through all this stuff. But while he's going through all this stuff, he's learning. He's learning things. And it dawned on me after I got done preaching last week, a valid part that I think I left out is this, is that in his letter that he wrote to the Ephesians, he said this, and I think it's very important for us to remember this, because I, I, I just, I'm so amazed at how he sat quietly. He wasn't in an uproar. He wasn't anxious. He just spoke what God told him to speak. And it says this in verse, uh, chapter 6. I'm going to start at verse uh, 11. It says, put on, Jack probably doesn't know this verse. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And listen to this. I want you to really listen to this. Harley, this is, I want, this is a verse for you. I want you to get this as much as you can get this. Because grandma needs this help from you, okay? It says this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Paul finally figured this out. He wasn't wrestling against Ananias. He wasn't wrestling against Lysias. He wasn't wrestling against those Jews that came after him. He wasn't wrestling against any of the people that accused him of anything. That wasn't where the battle lay. And so he didn't go in an uproar. He didn't go after them. And, and folks... This is a big thing in our lives today in this world. We always seek after the person that says something and go after them. And it's happening right down through our, even in, in grade school, in kindergarten, all the way up through. We hear about how people are going after different people because they said something or they looked, like, they, they looked at me funny or whatever it might be. And you go after them. Not recognizing the fact that, folks, we don't live in that fleshly world. We live in a spiritual world. In the spiritual world, there is God and there is Satan. God is in control. Satan's trying to be in control. And he's the one that's causing all the problems. And so he is not, we don't have to fight against the person. Jesus gave us the rules way back. He said, love one another. There's nothing else that he said for us to do. I mean, I know there's little things, but the basic rule of thumb for us as Christians is to love one another. Love. 
That encompasses everything that is good and nothing that is not good. It's love. And Paul, I think he looked at these people that were accusing him and he loved them. But he's in this situation and that's why I wanted to read what Jesus said. He was given the words to speak at that time. And look at what it did. It immediately cooled Felix right down. Felix had nothing more to say. He says, in fact, in reality, he never ever in the next two years ever found anything to accuse Paul of other than the fact that he was very adamant in his presenting of the gospel. And he did it for two years with Felix. But nowhere did he ever find any reason for him to be held, for, for uh, having been accused of doing anything that was wrong. So there's two elements there. First of all, when you're right, you're right. And if you know in your heart that God's confirmed in your heart that you are correct, stand on that. Truth is truth. And then recognize that the people that confront us, that battle against us in any way, shape, or form, and you understand what I'm talking about. Look at, I'll tell you something, Kathy and I were just leaving church last week. We hadn't gotten to the top of the hill when a comment I made turned into a comment that she made, and I don't even know if she remembers this, and it immediately, I was angry. But before I got over the hill, I said, Huh. You don't waste any time, do you, Satan? She didn't do anything wrong. It was my interpretation of what she did. My perception. Years ago, I would have never got to that point of recognizing that. It would have turned out into a lashing, of which when we got all done, she would have won anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you see what I'm saying? It, it, it's, it's the enemies against us, and he wants to seek to kill, steal, and destroy. It goes on all the time. But it's not man on man, woman on woman. It's not person on person. It's person on Satan and all his cohorts that are trying to destroy us. If we take just that one truth and put it, apply it to our lives, and every time... It doesn't come overnight. It really doesn't. It takes, I think it took him years to get to this point. And I think that because of the two year vacation he had in Caesarea, he was still learning more things to get him prepared to go to Rome for what he had to face there. But if we were to apply this in our lives, our lives would be at more peace and have more joy. And the other thing is we will do what our prayer just said earlier, is we want to reflect Jesus to people. Do you know how astoundingly loud a Christian characteristic is in the midst of non-Christians? It probably didn't say that the right way. When we exude that love that Jesus told us to share with one another, it changes the dynamic of everything else around you. It makes a difference. I saw it yesterday at the wedding that I did. It made a difference. I convinced people that as Christians we can have fun. And it sounds really foolish until you recognize there was a couple people there that said, we've been to weddings before, we've never laughed. Wow, if you can't laugh at a wedding, what do you do at a funeral? I mean, seriously, what do you, it, 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 laughter, you should have laughter at a wedding. There should be joy. It should be a great time. And God can use me being a foolish to do things like that, which I don't always advocate for people to do. But God tells me stupid things to say, and I say them. And because Kathy always told me, you open up your mouth, stupid comes out. <laughs> but it does, but look, it, it does make people laugh. Well, not all the time. Boy. That's right, man. We talked about this more. We're not supposed to say always and never. <laughs> See, I haven't learned that one yet. Jeez. Just when I thought I almost got there. <laughs> But see, you see what I'm saying, Harley? You understand what I'm saying? We don't fight against people. 
It's not the people we fight against. I'm looking at you, Harley. I'm talking to you, your grandma. But not just her. I'm talking to all of you. But I want, I want to include Harley in on it because she's got quite a life. And we love you here a lot. So when the time comes and you're in a situation, trust God and God will give you the words to say. That's what Jesus said. Now let's move on to verse 22 and it says this. But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias the commander comes down, I will make a decision on your case. This is so interesting because Lysias the commander never came down. He was never invited. It never happened. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. So here he is. He's in the, the, the palace of the king at Caesarea. I want to tell you folks, get some pictures of Caesarea and take a look at it. It's a very beautiful city. It's really beautiful. And the, and the water over the, the, that they overlook is beautiful blue. It's just wonderful uh, weather. It's, I guess it's like, I think I mentioned that, like living in Palm Springs or something. Like, it's just supposed to be a beautiful, beautiful place. And drat, you know, here, here God spoke there. Jesus spoke to, to Paul in the middle of the night while he was still in Jerusalem. said, don't worry, Paul, I'm going to send you to Rome. And now I'm sitting in this for two years. Isn't that funny? He gave Paul a two-year vacation in a beautiful spot. He didn't have to pay for room. He didn't have to pay for board. He had open status. Everybody could come and go as they please. And he had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to share. His friends came. In fact, it's speculated that Luke spent a lot of time with him. And this is where he got all the information to write his letters. It also is speculated, and this is a, just a thought process, um, but I've, I've heard it from people and I've read it just read it the other day in one of the, Bi the Bible that Jack gave me, had this excerpt in there about, about this, and it's the book of he the Hebrews. People have different ideas about who wrote Hebrews. A lot of people think it was Paul, but it doesn't say Paul, so because it didn't say Paul, that's the biggest reason why they don't think it's Paul, because I, Paul, wasn't in there. But the difference was, and this is, I thought, was pretty good speculation, this, it was spoken that they believe that Paul did write the book of Hebrews. He wrote it to the Jews, about the Jews, and he didn't want the Jews to get in trouble by being associated with him if they read it and got caught with it, or he didn't want the Jews to turn it off without reading it because, oh, Paul wrote that, and we don't want anything to do with Paul. Both of those are very good ideas, thoughts on it means nothing one way or the other in the long, in the big scheme, but, but it's interesting to, to, because if you read Hebrews, it's written a lot like what his letters are, but it's more turned toward the Jewish people. All of his other letters are actually written to Gentiles. So that's a little history lesson. Okay, after some days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith of Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. I want to talk about this. This is something I thought was interesting, and I want you to catch this. First of all, we have three characters here. We have Felix, we have Drusilla, and we have Paul. Felix, former slave, friend of Claudius, the emperor, playmate, who gave him his freedom along with his brother, um, Pallas, I think, I can't remember, any, Pallas or something like that. Um, and his brother, as I told you last week, was treasurer, uh, secretary of the treasury. In other words, he had control of the money's purse strings for the emperor. And, but Felix was a slave, set free, and given a position of authority as pure procreator of this 
village, this, this whole area. Unheard of. Absolutely unheard of. No one ever did that. He ascended to that height. So stop and think about it. He started way down here. He's what? Now he's up here. He's a ruler. He has authority over all these people. But you know what his reputation was? He was awful. He killed people. He stole from people. He, was, he accepted bribes and would do anything. He was, a, he was the worst to the Jewish people. He was awful to them. They say it was because his slave mentality never left him when, as he was set free. And he just wanted to get back at people. This is what happened to him when he was a kid. This is what I'm going to do to people. So that's Felix. And now you got Drusilla. Now the story goes something like this. Drusilla was somewhere between 16 and 22. Stories changed from different authors. She had already been married. She was promised to one man who was supposed to change to become Jewish, get pro promised by her father, who had some authority. She, he didn't change to becoming a Jew, so she went off and married another guy. But Felix ran across her, saw her, procured a, um, a sorcerer to set a spell over her to make her leave her husband to come with him. And the whole reason why was because she was absolutely beautiful. Beautiful beyond beauty. Now it's amazing to me, Felix had three wives. We don't know the way, what name of the one wife, but the second wife's name was Drusilla, and the third wife's name is Drusilla. Smart man, I guess. I don't know. You can't get in trouble with that. So anyway, what happened is she became his wife. She never divorced the other one. And she never finalized the promise with the first one. You see, there's a lot of trouble going on here. I feel sorry for her. Because again, she's anywhere from 16 to 20, 21, 22, somewhere in that vicinity. Young, taken advantage of, and found herself in this position. But she kind of liked this position of being in authority having everything at her hand, at whatever she wanted, it was there. And then you've got Paul. Paul's a prisoner. Paul has nothing except for Jesus. Not bad, huh? Nothing. He shows nothing. And look it. He gets the chance to share time after time. It's interesting. Felix knows about the way the way, which is the Christ, Christians. He knows about it because he's married to a Jewish woman who understands these things. And so he gets an opportunity to sit down and have Paul share with him concerning his faith in Christ. Now, I don't think Paul ever said, no, I don't have time. This is what he wanted to do. And he said he, he did first, he, talk, he reasoned, he reasoned. And I like that, and that's very, very important for us. When we share the gospel, reason with people. Reason means that you're not cramming it down their throat. It's a difference. Again, we go back to what Jesus said, love one another. Reason with them. There's people that do things that I don't necessarily agree with, but I don't chase them away because of that. God changed me. Holy Spirit changed me. He'll change. The Holy Spirit will, has the ability to change each one of us. So don't get wrapped up in little things. Don't force things down their throat. Paul reasoned with them. And he reasoned with them about righteousness. What's righteousness? He had to tell them that Christ died for them. Because in and of themselves, there is no righteousness. They have no righteousness. They think we have a lot of people in this world that are full of self-righteousness, but where's that going to get you? Right? Straight in hell. Because there is no righteousness of ourselves. But it says that uh, in 2 Corinthians, it said, For he made him, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Paul had the opportunity of sharing the whole salvation message with Felix and with Drusilla. The whole story. 
And Paul, being reasoned, he could actually go through the whole Old Testament because God had revealed to him that, was, that Jesus is, is in all of that. And he was able to sit down time after time, said they went together very, many times, reasoning with them. And he, and he told them about the love of Jesus. But nothing changed. And then he went on to this. Then he talked to him about self-control. How many people here have no problem with self-control? I was going to ask the question the other way. How many people have trouble with, with self-control? A lot of hands on that one. Self-control is, and is very synonymous with temperance. And see, Paul, because he, he knew what was going on, he actually probably stood there with Felix and told him the things that he was doing that were wrong. And he probably told Drusilla the things that she had been going through, they were wrong. And that she was married and she was married twice and she wasn't, things, everything was out of line. So they learned it over and over again. They kept reading. He kept sharing with them, reasoning with them, not cramming it down their throat, reasoning with them about this, revealing to them that self-control is the fruit of the Spirit. He writes that in his letter. Where do you think he got these ideas from hanging out with this kind of situation? The Lord revealed that to him, and that's one of the fruit of the spirits, is to have self-control. These two didn't have it. Now you probably wonder, well, what did that do for them? Well, let's look at it. The second, third part he looked, talked about was judgment, and last week I talked about judgment, so I don't have to go back into that again. He talked about judgment. There is a judgment coming. Everyone goes through a judgment. Either you are justified here with the blood of Jesus, or your, your judgment comes at the white, great white throne. Those are the two. He told them about this, and look at the reaction. Felix was afraid. Other versions call it Felix trembled. So can you imagine that? You come face to face with truth. Somebody tells you you've done something wrong. Somebody tells you that this is wrong in your life and this is where it's going to take you. And you get scared about it. But look at what Felix did. Procrastinated. Just like everything else that he did. He procrastinated. He procrastinated getting Lysias down there to take care of it. He didn't want Paul to go. You know why he didn't want Paul to go? It tells us he thought he was going to get a bribe. All his purpose was in spending time with him was he thought that maybe he could get some more money. That was it. I don't know about Drusilla. We, it doesn't tell us how her reaction was. Other than we do know this, they did have a child together. And of all the people that were lost in the, in the uh, volcanic eruption in Pompeii, one of the few people that were recorded being there was their son, and they believe that Drusilla was with them. And they got buried in volcanic ash. And that's how they died. And we don't know whether she ever turned her life around. At that time, her husband, Felix, it says, if you find out here in the last verse, it says, after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix. Felix wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. Let me tell you why. He left, Paul bound, left him bound there because it was the Jewish people that were at an outcry to Caesar saying how bad he was because something had happened and he had gone after the Jews again and tortured them and, and just annihilated some of them. He was so bad. That's what he was doing that he thought if he left Paul there, that would, that would bode good for him when he went in front of Caesar. Now it's amazing that his brother had enough influence on Caesar, or I don't mean Caesar, Claudius, had enough influence on him that he was never, though accused and tried, he was never convicted of any wrongdoings. Can you imagine having that kind of influence in the political world, that you can do bad things, people know you do bad things, and you don't get convicted for it, and you don't go to jail for it? Have we ever, ever, ever seen any of that before? 
He died of tuberculosis shortly thereafter. I think it was tuberculosis. The bottom line is this. Here we are in beautiful downtown Caesarea in the palace. He's, Paul's got the run of the place, though he's the prisoner there. He's enjoying the fruits of everything that's going on around him. He has love in his heart. He has joy in his heart. He has peace in his heart. He's doing what God's called him to do. He's not getting all anxious because it's, but, but God, you told me you were, I was going to go to Rome. He's just taking it easy. He's understanding that God and God's sovereign, and he says, I'll wait till God sends me. He's got a job for me to do. And so for two years he sat there. But who was the prisoner? Wasn't it Felix who thought he had all the power? He was imprisoned by his own lusts, his own desires. He had no self-control. He couldn't control anything that he did. He had nothing like that. And Drusilla, all wrapped up in her life as it was, though sad as it might be, and I kind of think that it wasn't all her fault to begin with. She had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to change. And Felix and Drusilla both said, we'll come again and talk. We'll come again and talk. My question is to you, is anybody here still putting it off? Have you put it off? Have you put off asking Jesus Christ into your life? You don't know when you walk out that door, if we'll have another volcanic eruption here and you'll never make it home. You don't know. Felix didn't know. And all of a sudden his time was up and he was gone, banished. That's what happened to him. He, he was banished from the whole place, banished and died. What about you? I look around the room, I see a lot of people that have accepted Jesus, and I understand that. But it's a question we have to ask, because when you get to sharing and reasoning with people, because that's your job, when you do start that reasoning and talking to people about righteousness and how they can't have righteousness of their own self, it's that robe of righteousness that Jesus puts on us. That's the only place we get righteousness. And we learn about having self-control. And we learn about the judgment knowing that when we accept Jesus, we go right straight to heaven. That's, that's our resurrection. That's what we're looking forward to. We have that. So understand that. Know that. So that when you get to share, you can share these facts. It's awesome to, to look at, at the different people that are involved in Scripture. And to, to get a chance to look into their lives and see how it really was back in those. Because you, like I told you, two weeks ago, when I read through chapter 24, I said, man, there's nothing here. There's a lot there. When you ask God to open it up and see, there's a lot there. He loves us so much. So my two points... I only remember one. <laughs> Boy, it goes fast. Remember, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. She'll always remember this, I hope. But we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I want to get to the point where nothing sets me off. I want to be able to walk around with a smile on my face, not a stupid grin, a smile... What was that about? <laughs> Set me right off already, Dave. <laughs> no, a smile on my face because it's the love of Jesus Christ in my heart. That's what I want. And that's what I want for each and every one of you. And we can have that. Can we always be righteous? Not in and of ourselves. We will fail, but we always can be righteous when we walk with our God. Always. Always, always. Hallelujah. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the life we find in your word. I thank you, Lord, for the joy we find when we walk, the walk that you've called us to walk, 
I thank you, Lord God, that you simplified all the laws and the rules and regulations down to two verses. One is to love our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is to love our neighbor as ourself. Lord, you've given us those rules. And Lord, just help us, each one of us, to open our hearts up, to love one another, see each other with not our eyes, but your eyes. Recognize that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities and rulers of darkness, Satan himself. And you have equipped us, as the chapter goes on in Ephesians, you have equipped us with all we need to stand against him. And I pray, Lord God, that we do that. And as we stand, as your word says, that we pray, having an open communication with you always. And I give you glory for that in Jesus' name. Amen.